This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 18th, 2009 in Oakland, California. I'm CNET's Tom Merritt. And from San Francisco, California, I'm Sarah Lane. And from uh, the offices downtown in San Francisco, I'm Roger Chang for Techzilla. Uh, Google wants to buy Yelp, y'all. This seems like it might be a smart acquisition. Google Neighborhood, where Google asked people uh, to put QR codes on their windows, is already out there. Uh, So why wouldn't Google uh, let Yelp get in on that action? Well, not let them, but get them in on that action by buying them. Yeah, I, I I know that Google is certainly interested in this market. I think Yelp made what was the last number about 300 million as of last year. And even if Google wants to build its own Yelp competitor, the fact that Yelp already has all of this data makes a lot of sense. Now I'm hearing up to 500 million dollars for this deal, which would be pretty high. Uh, so obviously Google values Yelp's data quite a bit. Yeah, and I, I guess with what TechCrunch is saying, $30 million of revenue, uh, Google probably feels like it's a decent bet. Uh, Google has a lot of cash. I think the thing that that concerns me is how big do we want Google to be? Uh, it's It's been interesting to watch the company move beyond search, and a lot of that's been really fun, like Gmail. But now we're hearing rumors about Google making a netbook. Uh, we have the Nexus One now Yelp. I mean, where does it end? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. I'm a Yelp user. I I enjoy Yelp. Um, I even enjoy the people that complain on Yelp regularly. That's part (laughs) of the fun of it. And it would be interesting to see what Yelp would be uh, bundled into Google. Does it stay as a standalone service? Does it get wiped out completely and and it turns into, I don't know, a bunch of Google search results? Uh, it's hard to say. Well, you know, it's interesting to say search results because I'm wondering if you search for anything like a store or a restaurant or, or mm-hmm. any kind of entertainment, do you automatically get a Yelp review at the top of your list or near the top of your list along with But that, that's basically what they want to do with places and Google neighborhood. So, yeah, of course you would. That 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 seems to make sense. They would just kind of incorporate it. The, the other question is, would it still be called Yelp or would it be called Places? Would, you know, would they would they merge it into an existing product? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the Yelp brand is pretty strong, but Google has has a, a history of, of wanting to change uh, names of companies that it acquires. Do you think they'll try to harmonize the Yelp? For example, I have a Yelp account, and I also have a Gmail account. Do you think they'll try to harmonize those two? Be, where they become under? Are you going to be logging in into a separate you know, in, you know, account? To- yeah. Uh, I mean, when Yahoo buys stuff, uh, you generally see the Yahoo log- login become the way you log in. I, I would assume that that's what Google would do as well. Uh, the other question is, are they actually going to get it? Uh, we all thought they were going to get Lala, uh, and that didn't happen. Uh, they, they they've did buy AdMob, uh, which is just, imp- again, making them bigger and bigger in the advertising business as well. So it'll be interesting to watch. Microblogging site Twitter uh, got hacked by a group of protesters calling themselves the Iranian Cyber Army. Uh, Twitter went offline for more than an hour overnight. Visitors were redirected to a page uh, declaring this site has been hacked by the Iranian cyber army. And the United States thinks uh, they control and manage Internet access, but they don't. That was the message. Um, This is a group of hackers, whether they're actually from Iran Iran or not, kind of doesn't matter to me. Uh, It points out that DNSSEC needs to be implemented. We need better DNS security because that's how they replaced this. They didn't they didn't hack into Twitter. They they hijacked the domain. Yeah, when I saw the fail will uh, last night, I thought, well, it's just, you know, too many people on Twitter, same old same. But uh, this is this is interesting. Uh, Twitter getting hacked because of course it's so popular right now. Of course this is going to be a target for for lots of folks. Are we going to see more of these types of things? Can the company clamp down on something like this before it really gets out of control um, and somebody does get into Twitter itself? I don't think there's any evidence that Twitter is vulnerable. Uh, I mean the the only the only vulnerabilities you you hear about, like Rick Sanchez getting hacked, are phishing attacks, where you trick someone into giving you access. 
Uh, so, so I feel like Twitter is pretty safe. It's only a couple of years old, right? Uh, so it's probably not 100% bulletproof. But this being a DNS hijack makes me much more concerned about the DNS infrastructure than it has me concerned about Twitter. I'm, I'm not so much a concern, but more of a, uh, a, a, a an academic uh, pondering. Like, does this does this imply that Twitter is becoming big enough and and high profile enough for people to kind of see it as a uh, a target in order to carry a message or some sort of, you know, politicization uh, of the medium in order to, because, you know, as I guess it has such a huge reach, uh, yeah, even from a couple of years ago. Hey, Twitter's made it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, like, does that, is that what that means? It's finally arrived. It's important. I don't have to explain to people why, why they might want to use Twitter. You can just say, look, it's important enough for hacker groups to, well, to like, hijack its domain. Are you going to see environmentalists try to hang their digital version of like a protest banner off a bridge on Twitter? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm still trying to explain to my family and my non-technical friends what Twitter is and how it works and how it's not just about what I had for lunch, although it is a lot of that. But, uh, but yeah, this definitely points to uh, the people who have access to these kinds of tools and want to make mischief, if not worse, are starting to see Twitter as a place that enough people have gathered and have information and things to say and other people be listening to that information that, uh, that, that, I don't know, it sounds, it seems like the company better get it together soon. Well, you know who else has to get it together? Buggy Software. Uh, the National Vulnerability Database has issued their list of the buggiest software in the land based on reported vulnerabilities. And the winner for the second year in a row is Firefox. Oh, congrats. 102 <laughs> bugs up from 90 last year. I mean, are, uh, are any of us surprised? Well, yeah. Well, well okay. But what, what, Firefox hold on. discloses all of them. So Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that I mean, so it doesn't you, mean it's it's the buggiest. It means it's it's the it's most open. transparent yes. about what's going on. I, I you know that's great. I still use Chrome because every time I launch Firefox, my my CPU on my little laptop starts to uh, overheat, and I hear the fans spin all the way up. Yeah, well, good luck uh, with those secret bugs that Google isn't reporting. Uh, for you. Uh, 102 bugs up from 90 last year. Uh, I think we can all agree, though, that Adobe Reader deserves to take second place, beating out Microsoft this year. Uh, as a Foxit Reader user myself, I say, whoever would use Adobe Reader? Exactly. It's just, Why? It's just a vector for disease. I've never seen another application so bloated that offered such a small se uh, set of features. Well, and apparently very insecure. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is this is from a not open piece of software. Uh, and before you Apple people get too smug, Apple QuickTime took third place. Ah, QuickTime, Oops. QuickTime. I remember that. Ugh. What? <laughs> I remember You're when like QuickTime is the days of yore. It QuickTime's was. Remember, we used to use it all the time at uh, SF State when we were learning how to desktop video edit. Still, oh, sure. still going strong. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. I never use it. It's I clunky, don't really know clunky. what I would use it for. But uh, but it's. Eh, I think I commend Firefox for because again, like you said, Tom, it's open source, and so that's just the way these things go. If there's a vulnerability, well, you hear about it on Firefox. So I think that more companies who aren't who clearly are not going to disclose. Uh, every bug that they find internally, right? Uh, and and very rarely even congratulate somebody, maybe an outside researcher who has has found something that uh, that the company then patches and and we all move on. That doesn't really happen all that often. You don't really mm -hmm. hear about what's going on internally and how things are getting fixed. So I wish more companies acted the way Firefox is. If you're uh, wondering where Internet Explorer and Chrome are on this list, they're not on it because users of their software have patches installed automatically. Uh, so that's something I'd like to see come to Firefox, to be honest, is, is automatic updates. Uh, and uh, a shout out to the folks at Skype, Yahoo IM, and AIM. None of them are on the list this year, although all three were on last year. Yeah, well, Yahoo I am. I don't use it. I'm an AIM user, definitely. Uh, I use Skype every so often, uh, kind of to you know, talk to friends and family who are who are overseas. 
but uh, but yeah, uh, if I'm on AIM, I would like it to be as 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 strong as possible. See, I use Trillion, and Trillion is on this list, so maybe I should switch to the actual clients. Yeah, I, yeah, uh, I used Trillion when I was still using a PC, but now that I've switched over to to Mac OS, it's I'm, on uh, ADM. Yeah, yeah, it's ADM because of Domoco. And uh, thank you to uh, GameSpot for forcing me to move over to AIM because that's what the company uses. Yeah, I think I was. What was I on? I think we mostly are using AIM. People are kind of all over the place at CNET, though. Um, Yahoo Instant Messenger was the big tech TV one, I remember. Hey, uh, the Blu-ray Disc Association has released its finalized 3D specs this morning, outlining what you can expect out of 3D Blu-ray next year. This is the uh, future. Full 1080p resolution, backward compatibility for both 3D Blu-ray players and 3D Blu-ray discs. And the use of the new MVC codec, uh, which is an extension of the existing ABC 3D. And the PS3 is not only going to support 3D gaming uh, by 2011, but it will also support 3D Blu-ray playback. That that machine is amazing. can do anything. Play your Blu-rays, yeah. play games. Well, I mean, I think the PS3 probably is the best Blu-ray player you can buy if you can it, afford yeah. it. It's not the cheapest one, right? But Definitely not the cheapest. Uh, but but certainly, you know, the fact that the PS3 is going to is in the spec for this, I, I think, is is certainly positive. I mean, even according to Robert Heron, it's still considered the kind of uh, uh, benchmark. That's the one you benchmark against in terms of uh, Blu-ray performance. Now, I've been saying for a long time that I feel like streaming is going to make the Blu-ray battle irrelevant. And I feel like I'm being proven wrong more and more. Uh, so do we feel like 3D is going to make Blu-ray more popular? Is it going to, you know, uh, because that's something that's going to be really hard to deliver over streaming. Is, is that going to be the thing that that keeps Blu-ray in the game? I want to say so, but at the same time, as someone who has to wear prescription eyewear, those, those glasses... I mean, just to get ones that fit my face and over my glasses, well, still haven't found that that magic one. And you know, I I don't know why. I just think that having to wear an, an extra pair of glasses over my glasses. I mean, I I love 3D, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I still find it to be. It, it gives me a little bit of motion sickness. I don't wear glasses, but uh, I feel for you, Roger, because who would want to wear glasses over glasses? And you need you need your actual glasses. Yeah. Or it's, you know, you can't see anything anyway. I don't know. I I know that 3D over streaming is that that's that's a pipe dream at least right now. But I I'm not so crazy about physical media. I know that they're the Blu-ray loyal faithful people out there. I I know. And you can't beat those specs in terms of quality, video quality. The 3D stuff, eh, I don't know. I don't know. It seems seems like a passing fad. I don't know. I, I go down to Best Buy, and I, I see them with all the new 3D-capable TVs all lined up near the front with little signs telling you what, what an amazing uh, – well, it's again, amazing, like 3D capable, feet. though, but how much content is actually going to be in 3D to the point where you would buy a 3D capable TV and feel like you paid more for a good reason? You know. 3D is just going to come with every TV, though. So at some point, people are just going to get used to it being in there. Whether they buy the TV to have 3D, it just will be there. Right. One good so, bellwether is always to see what kinds of uh, creation uh, hardware you can, like, in other words, video cameras, editing software, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You're beginning to see a lot of kind of prosumer-level uh, 3D video cameras. So I, I, it, me, it tells me that someone thinks that 3D is here to stay. Well, yeah, the people who are making all that 3D equipment. <laughs> I mean, you know, hey. Uh, Bing and get sued. Bing Information Design in St. Louis, Missouri, has sued Microsoft Corp. for trademark infringement in the St. Louis City Circuit Court, asserting unfair competition, trademark infringement, and tortious interference. Whoa. It's a uh, small privately held information graphics and multimedia design company, but they claim that Microsoft's use of Bing is uh, is confusing. causing confusion. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, now uh, Bing Information Design has been around since 2000, I believe. Right. You know, Microsoft so, Bing, pretty new. It's so, been around nine years. Bing's so it, only been around a couple of years. And let's be honest, there is no way that Microsoft did not realize that Bing Information Design existed. It just doesn't think that Bing Information Design was big enough to be able to fight it. This is Microsoft we're talking about. So whether or not the company, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what happened within Microsoft, but I'm going to bet that they were like, eh, let them take us to court. We'll just settle and, and continue on our way. Well, Kevin Cutts, a, a spokesman for uh, Microsoft, told the St. Louis Business Journal, uh, we do not believe there is any confusion in the marketplace. <laughs> and I have to have to tend to agree. I don't think anyone is going to Bing the search it. Well, I don't think anyone's going to Bing the search engine, but I don't think anyone's going to the Bing the search engine and saying, wait a minute, is, <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to get all of my graphic and multimedia design in the St. Louis area done at the search engine. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that that's the confusion that the company is claiming, though, right? It's more what of... Are they, I, are don't, they, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're... Maybe you're searching on Google for an alternative browser, and you type in bit. Well, no, I see mean, that didn't. Uh, that realistically, I don't think this is about people confusing the Bing, uh, their Bing services with. The it's Bing about searching. maybe the information. But it has to be. It has folks. to be to convince a judge, right? Oh no, I, yeah, I, I'm totally aware of that. So but they, the, they the must motivations think they be. have enough of a case that they can get a judge to uh, at least admit the case to court which then might make Microsoft give them a settlement and pay them off to go away. But I imagine Microsoft is probably not going to want to set that precedent. So I wouldn't expect that they'll get the money out of Microsoft. But they certainly got some press out of it, right? Yeah. You yeah. know, they probably would get farther if Bing wasn't already a word that people use. You know, it's kind of Bing. I mean, I mean it, yeah. that, that is it's not, I don't know if it's even a real word, but it's not like... Bing cherries. I mean, so, like something, something that was made up or spelled weird. Then they'd really have a case. It's probably is it named after a guy named Bing, the the graphic design company. I mean, I was don't it started know. by Bing Crosby. Maybe it was. Is he from St. Louis? Maybe yeah. they should just change their name of the company to Crosby. Uh, well, no, they're not going to give up. They want to fight this to the. They want to the fight end. this yeah. until it yeah. somehow bears fruit. They should call themselves Bling Information Design because we make great graphics. So you remember a couple of years ago when we talked about uh, the Netflix data set uh, that they put out with anonymized information. Uh, and we've talked about the fact that that anonymity had been broken, mostly because you can take things like zip code, birth date, gender, and there, it's been shown that there's uh, a chance for for you to figure out who someone is, even though it doesn't have their name on it. Uh, in fact, the the famous thing, uh, was uh, a blockbuster data set revealing an 87% chance that a person could be uniquely identified just from zip code, birth date, and gender. Uh, well, an in-closet lesbian mother is suing Netflix, alleging the movie rental company made it possible for her to be outed when it disclosed insufficiently anonymous information about a half a million of their customers as part of that $1 million Netflix prize. Now, and that is because of her viewing habits, and she uh, obviously has gone through some hardship because of this. That was what Netflix was was allowing people to see? Well, Netflix was allowing you to see viewing habits of anonymized users. It just okay. had a number, right? Yeah. She's saying that you can look at the data that they put in this data set and figure out it's her and figure out that she's a lesbian. But how can they do that with, with when the viewing her viewing history is anonymized? Well, the viewing history being a bunch of uh, movies that are uh, generally loved by lesbians would be the way to tell that the the user was a lesbian. Right. Uh, zip code. It, maybe she lives in a very sparsely populated zip code. Sure. Sure. Uh, birth. If there's a birth date or you know gender, that that's it's it wow. is. I mean, again, this is going back to that blockbuster data. Uh, you don't need that much information to start ruling out possibilities and narrowing it down to you get an 87% chance that you can say, yep, pretty sure I know who that is. This is, hmm, well, you know, the, the this particular case aside, it sets a very dangerous tone for all sorts of things. People being able to find other people on social networks without them actually being friends or 
I don't know, uh, you know, advertisers being able to target people based on very simple, what we think is, think of as very simple information, like my gender, my zip code, maybe, you know, a couple things that I might've clicked on in the past and you can find me kind of thing. I don't really know what it means, but I don't like the sound of it. Yeah. And so the, the lawsuit is being led uh, by Joseph Malley, who recently reached a multi-million dollar settlement with Facebook over its Beacon program, uh, which was sharing users' blockbuster rentals. So the the question is whether Netflix should have known their data set would have anonymity, but uh, it sounds like she's got a uh, high-quality lawyer to fight in her side. Hmm. Uh, you can buy the Esquire magazine on your phone. Now, this is a little... Okay, so... It's a, well, it's an app, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's I didn't I didn't get an iPhone uh, right away. I, I waited, you know, about a year, but I but I have one now. And I don't know. I mean, they're so small. I, I don't want to read a magazine on my iPhone that <laughs> that just sounds like it's going to hurt my head. I think it's interesting that Esquire is trying to uh, push back on this whole, you know, um, uh, FUD about the magazine industry going away because everybody's gone digital. But is the iPhone really the answer to this? I don't think so either. It's, so it's two ninety nine to get the app, and that gets you whatever the current issue is. And then through in-app purchases uh, on the iPhone, you can buy future issues. So it's not like you're like having to buy a new app every month. Right. Um, and, you know, it does some fun stuff. Uh, it makes it easy to scroll through different articles, you look for visual or textual indicators, but I'm with you. I actually do read comics and books on my phone, but I prefer to read them on my Kindle. I prefer to read the comics, or at least the books. I, I re prefer, well, with the comics, it's it's more of a, a matter of convenience versus pre pref preference, right? It's the fact that I can do it means I'll read a comic that I might not bother to go out and get otherwise. But I yeah. don't know that I would buy a magazine no, the, and I don't the, know that the, I'm dying for a magazine. I could just go to the web, right? The, uh, and the, yeah, the form factor would just have to be much bigger. You'd have to have something that is, I don't know. For me, I read plenty of magazines on on the web, but my desktop monitors, you know, would it make more sense to be inches. like on a Kindle or a or a, a tablet or something? Oh yeah. yeah, no, I love reading newspapers on the Kindle. That's what, that's one of the the things I loved about the original Kindle. Is is like I can read, you know, the the Oakland Tribune on it. So, yeah, I'm I'm still on a BlackBerry. So, yeah, I mean, my my opinion isn't too weighted here. Yeah, <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it seems like a fun experiment by Esquire, and shit. some somebody in a conference room was like, "Let's you know, you know, let's get crazy here. Let's just you know, we're, we're going to get a lot of attention because." They're not the first magazine to try to do this, the first publication, but it is Esquire. And it when you look at the numbers, you think, okay, well, if somebody was very compelled to consume Esquire on their iPhone, the pricing is not uh, unreasonable. But I, I just, I, I don't know how many other magazines might follow suit. Just don't see it. Yeah, I think I need a little more than three and a half, four inches of display space. Uh, and at that point, I'm just going to use my, my laptop. I, I I don't mind reading an article in, in a web browser on the iPhone, uh, but I'm not paying for that. Right. Right. No. And no. I can save that and look at it on my desk, on my laptop later, if I want. Yeah. I don't know about that. Uh, Reuters saying that the Pentagon has closed a security breach that would have allowed insurgents to hack into data feeds from drone aircraft uh, that provide real-time video of war zones. Uh, this is after a report in the Wall Street Journal showing uh, Shiite fire fighters in Iraq using software to intercept the video feeds and let them monitor U.S. military operations. So it was being exploited. Oh, great. Now we got to deal with drones getting breached. What's next? It's so the... <sighs> But, but, I, I, I but thought Sarah, that, but Sarah, we don't have to deal with them being breached anymore. They fixed it. Well, that's good. But I thought that their response was a little flippant. Like, this is an old story. We fixed that a long time ago. Okay, well, you did. 
<laughs> there was an issue in the beginning. And what kind of information do people have now about the military in 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 highly covert situations? And you know what's interesting is part of this is because the feeds aren't encrypted because they didn't expect anyone to be looking, and so Encrypt this is all the things. Yes, this is one of the this is one of those times where. People just kind of assumed a certain level of sophistication that people wouldn't have to be able to hack it. But you know what? That was maybe eight years ago, and technology has progressed, and it's gotten cheaper for a lot of cheap enough for a lot of people to make it uh, more acceptable to a lot more people. Yeah, I, I mean, you're not going to expect the U.S. military to come out and announce without provocation that they had a vulnerability because that's announcing to the enemy that they can hijack your stuff. So right. you just don't say anything about it at all. The, only the fact that the Wall Street Journal brought this to light is why the military is even responding to it. Yeah, and I do want to make clear that this uh, wasn't uh, an instance of someone controlling the drone, but rather taking the video feed information right. that flows back uh, and just siphoning it. Well, And, and that, that's and not I, worth anything anymore because conditions have changed. Well, and as drones continue to not only be you know something that consumers are interested in but obviously um defense departments are interested in okay well this particular drone security breach has been fixed if we believe that's true great we can all move on are they going to use is the drone going to be using the same software is it going to be the the same company making all the same drones for the military going forward it seems like we're going to get more and more competition from various companies, um, especially those who have contracts uh, with the U.S. government. And I certainly hope that the future drones are a lot safer. All right. Here's a way to make some movie, folks. Uh, I said movie, but I meant money. But it's money with a movie. A producer from Uruguay uh, made a science fiction film on YouTube, ended up with a ton of emails and a film deal with Sam Raimi's Ghost House worth three hundred million dollars. Dang! Wow. Panic Attack was uploaded on Thursday. By Monday, Hollywood studios were all over Alvarez, Fede Alvarez, to develop and direct a film based on one of his ideas. This is a pretty cool little uh, clip. He, I think, he did a, a majority, if not all, the animation himself, and it's pretty cool. Like, if uh, you want to see something attack the capital of Uruguay, that's. That would, that would be it. I mean, well, this is going to end up being the way movies are made. I can I can tell this already. I, is this is this the new reel? Instead of having a reel of yes, all your accomplishments, exactly. this is like my demo reel. I'm just going to blurt it out there on something. Yeah, well, this uh, is the beauty of YouTube. Well, and it just goes to show you who is you know who is watching YouTube. Well, clearly Hollywood studios and people who want to to partner with extremely smart people who aren't already in the industry or at least are are, are less visible in the industry. Uh, Alvarez, he got enough attention that it's kind of like YouTube can be a place where you can get a job if you get enough attention. I mean, it's it's, it's that's he it's got like lucky. Star but Search it's, online. You, you, know, right. you put your talent there and everyone can see it. It's interesting because uh, back in the late 90s, remember the 90s? Uh, it was often said that a lot of producers would go to Comic Cons and book fairs and other events in order to see if they could find any kind of story worth translating or adapting for, uh, for the larger screen. And this is, might be just the next logical step where people are going to YouTube and seeing like, hey, who has a really cool sci-fi idea of aliens? This is the cool thing about YouTube. It democratizes content creation. Uh, and that's why you're seeing so many people flooding into it. Uh, and this sort of thing is going to happen more often. We're going to see more people using it and uploading lots of different kinds of, of stories there. It's really, really fun to watch. Yeah, and I, I, I also think it's... Um, sorry, Roger. I, I also... I feel like most kind of serious creators use Vimeo. So I, I, I wonder why mm. YouTube was chosen in this situation. Yeah, maybe it's just, just the platform he likes better. But uh, Vimeo is like well known for kind of those the kind of flashy reels type of thing. I think a lot but, of people do both though. Like they, they yeah, go on Vimeo so. for the professional presentation, but they also are uploading their content to YouTube. Yeah. Well, because there's Vimeo more people doesn't on have YouTube. Yeah, the amount of there's eyes more on eyeballs YouTube. on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Hey, uh, speaking of eyeballs, we want your eyeballs to participate in our forum uh, and your fingers too. Submit stories and, uh, and talk about them there. Uh, and you can also do it in our IRC chat room as well. And we love getting your email. Let's check out the mailbag. 
Angry Andy, that's what he calls himself, says, For years now I've heard you explain that DRM only punishes the honest customers. Well, today I was such an honest customer for the last time. I went to see Avatar at my local Cineplex, saw a huge crowd standing in the lobby, and I knew something was up. The theater manager explained that the premiere screening of the 3D version could not commence. They'd been waiting for the digital key to arrive that's necessary to decrypt the film. It should have arrived by email from Fox over four hours earlier, but it had not. Apparently, this was a problem for every movie theater in Germany and probably every cinema in Europe that wanted to show the film that day. The 2D version, not affected, by the way. Uh, Andy says, I gather 50% of all the perplexed visitors had no idea what kind of key he was talking about, but definitely 100% were pissed and had no understanding why they made it all the way and the effort to come to the movie theater only, only to be told, sorry, we don't want your money. Uh, Andy says, back in... Uh, Oh, Andy says, uh, the 16th of December, 2009, 2009, that was the day he went to see Avatar, was supposed to be the day I saw a masterpiece. Turned out to be the day I swore to never set foot in a movie theater again. Screw you, Fox, and happy downloading. Gee, it's almost like they punished an honest customer and turned them into a dishonest customer as yeah. a result. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Andy, sure I feel your anger. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know, we talked about Chrome OS uh, and whether it could get in trouble in the EU uh, because it's only a browser. And of course, Microsoft is being required to provide that browser ballot in the in the EU. Uh, We had one person ask why it's okay for Apple to only have its own browser, Safari, on the iPhone. Uh, But then we had uh, Hoyland Wolf uh, recommend a couple of points that differentiates Chrome OS from Microsoft Windows. Windows runs proprietary closed source code, whereas Chrome OS can be built and customized from open source code, from Chromium OS. A competing browser vendor is free to put their own browser in the place of the Chrome browser and reuse the existing kernel and underlying code within the restrictions of the license. The Microsoft Windows OS is itself a platform for running applications. By contrast, the Chrome browser is the sole app that runs on Chrome OS, and the Chrome browser is the platform, not the operating system. So uh, I thought that was pretty well explained. Thank you, Hoyland Wolf, for that. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for writing in, and thanks to everybody who supports us. Uh, we love doing the show. If we're lucky, we'll be doing this in another five years. Oh my gosh, I hope so. You can support us directly on PayPal uh, by going to the address dailytechnewsshow.com slash support, and please peruse our fine selection of DTNS stuff at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you want to join us live, your connection's strong enough anyway, we're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you next time. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>